and by far the worst one of them all. Most barbarous and insidious in its design, the Boston Port Bill. It was determined by Frederick Lord North, presently the first minister of the government of Great Britain, that upon the 1st of June next, these six days hence, the port of Boston is to be closed to all traffic and commerce, blockaded by a fleet of British warships, allowing nothing in and nothing out. We hear that there are some 20,000 of inhabitants in the metropolis of Boston, and further, that everyone's livelihoods depend directly upon the harbor. It therefore should not require the penetration of an Isaac Newton to discover that after a mere number of days there will be terrible suffering in that place, misery, starvation, and this too being meted out upon all those many innocents within that place, women and children who had nothing to do whatever with the destruction of East India tea, for which now an entire population is being so harshly punished. And furthermore, my friends, make no mistake upon it, the threats are being daily made in the halls of the British government that the rest of us throughout America can expect much the same rough treatment. I've expressed this concern to a number of gentlemen here about this city. To my considerable disappointment, I have discovered that there appears to be still here in Williamsburg a great deal of indifference as to what the plight of those in Boston might be. Oh, Mr. Henry, say these gentlemen, let us not involve ourselves in their affairs, sir, lest we should bring some troubles here to the Old Dominion. We certainly do not wish to incur the wrath of the mighty British lion. And you forget yourself, sir, they continue. Why, these Bostonians have clearly brought these actions upon them themselves. Tis most regrettable indeed that they in New England are so easily given over to mob rule and to violence. For shame, say I. Let us speak frankly. We in Virginia have never had any great love nor affection for the people of New England anyway. <laughs> Truth be told, for generations we have despised them, owing chiefly to their Congregationalist faith. It is their established church, a religion most intolerant of any religion which differs from their own, to include even that of the Church of England here in Virginia. Believe it or no, we hear that even in this most enlightened year of 17 and 74, in some reaches of Massachusetts Bay, they continue to stone to death Baptists and Quaker men, <laughs> and for nothing else other than their religious convictions. And this I, as the most pious and devout Christian myself, regard as most reprehensible. Furthermore, we have long disliked and distrusted the New England men for their very strict and austere code of morality. They appear, from all the reports we've heard through the years, to be a people who deny themselves any pleasures at all on this earthly plane, which is most unlike those of us here in Virginia. <laughs> As examples, for years it has been illegal in the town of Boston for there to be plays, shows, or exhibitions at the theater. For there they regard the playhouse to be the devil's workshop, that it encourages young gentlemen and ladies to idleness and immoral pursuits, and thus to ban. It is illegal in the town of Boston to wager upon a horse race. These are national pastimes in Virginia. <laughs> it has been said, and correctly so, methinks, that Virginians will dance or they will die. And yet even that most innocent and delightful of diversions, the chief manner in which young men and women court one another before marrying, for heaven's sake, is frowned upon by the Congregationalists there in New England. And for those few numbers of Virginians who in years past have actually met or encountered these New England men, I myself have never. Uh, seafarers who have sailed to the northward ports Upon their returns home, they have always described the men, most especially of the town of Boston, in the same most unfavorable and unflattering of lights. That there they are possessed of a harsh and brutal sound to their speech, <laughs> making it difficult to stay in the same room with them when they are talking, <laughs> which is constantly, for they appear at least to be a people who insist upon dominating all discussion and discourse, <clears throat> and all the while imposing their sense of morals upon all who are within their company. I must confess that, like all of you, I am certain, I too have fought back the temptation to share in that widely held prejudice of the New England men. But whatever your sentiments, my friends, either at present or in past, all of America is now thrown into one great mass. Those men in the halls of the British government are not referring only so contemptuously of Bostonians nor New Yorkers, but rather all of us to them are filthy American provincials common buckskins. Indeed, I'll remind you how the word Americans 
is recently defined in Dr. Samuel Johnson's newest dictionary of the King's English as a race of convicts who deserve nothing short of a hanging. <laughs> Therefore, I say the time is nigh. We must set aside those petty differences we've ever held with those to the northward and instead agree to stand side by side and with manly firmness with them. For their fight with Great Britain is our fight. Here, here. Ours is a common cause. In my humble view, there's nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery.